the Lord for a blessing on the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Merciful God and Father, take away the darkness of our hearts, take away the poverty of our hearing, take away the lack of clarity in the word proclaimed, and sanctify our worship by your Spirit so that as we hear your gospel declared, our hearts may find peace, our minds may be illuminated, our spirits may soar. In the praise of your name and in the wonder of your love for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, none of these things are possible apart from your Spirit's presence and power. And so answer your promise with faithfulness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, First Corinthians 16 is our scripture reading, or rather 6, 1 Corinthians 6. It's verses 12 through 20, page 1134. It's a very specific application of what it is that we have in Lord's Day 12, a very timely one, a very current application. We live in a very sexually immoral culture. And what does it mean to be a Christian in such a culture? What does it mean to be anointed by the Holy Spirit to witness to Christ? That's what's before us in Lord's Day 12. We're studying the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior. We have heard that He is Jesus, that is His name. And now we hear about His title, that He is the Christ. And we'll hear what that means for us as Christians. And here's one a timely and important application of that. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Thus for the reading of God's holy word. Then to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 12, page 213. Or 851, no, not 851, page 213 in your Forms and Prayers books in the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. It is page 877, page 877, page 213. We're going to recite together these two question and answers, 31 and 32. Beginning with question 31, why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. Our only high priest, who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually intercedes for us before the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the deliverance he has won for us. And then question answer 32, but why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in His anointing. I am anointed to confess His name, to present myself to Him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, 
and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. This the church does believe. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord, one of the big questions that humanity has long struggled with and that is certainly increasingly part of our culture is the question, who am I? It's an enormous question, really, and one that cannot really quickly be answered, not even in this service. It's one that defies easy explanation. As a thought experiment, just imagine who you'd be if you were not born into this family, the family you're born into, or into this community, or into this time. Imagine that you were born in China a thousand years ago. Who would you then be? It's almost impossible to imagine. You can get some basic ideas, but, but to really understand your identity would be very hard. And so it has always been. Who am I is a question that we constantly wrestle with. When I was young, people would go off to Europe in the summer in order to find themselves. That was the phrase people would use. I need to go find myself. I need to know who I am. And of course, we know how our current culture deals with questions of identity. How they deal with the the decision as to who defines us. The answer used to be that our activity defined us. We would identify ourselves by what we do. I'm a student, we would say. I'm an employer or employee. I'm a farmer. I'm a laborer. I'm a construction worker. Sometimes we define ourselves by our relationships. We say I'm a husband or a wife. I'm a friend or a parent or a grandparent. But it seems that it's getting harder and harder to define ourselves in these ways. Now we define ourselves in all sorts of fantastic and unbelievable ways. As a Christian community, we look out at our world and we scratch our heads sometimes at what we hear the world doing when it comes to questions of identity. Everything seems to be moving and changing. Nothing is what it used to be. And what it will become, no one seems to know. And there is a very good reason for why it's so confusing to us. There's a very good reason for why we struggle with this question. And that's because in the context of our world, we have disconnected all of understanding, all of identity, meaning, purpose, all of our vision of the world, our expectation and understanding of what life is all about. We've disengaged it from who God is and what God has done. We have forgotten that He's the Creator and the Redeemer of all that is. And when we've done that, when we did that, then we had to find our meaning, our identity in something else. Really, in the end, we shouldn't be surprised as church. We shouldn't be surprised as Christians who know our Bibles, who've studied our Bibles well. None of us should be as surprised when someone says, who's a man, I identify as a woman. Or when some child at school says, I identify as a cat. None of us should be surprised by that for we've read Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis, already in Genesis chapter 3, the devil said to man, said to woman, you don't have to be who God says you are. He's trying to prevent you from enjoying life. He's pressing you down. He's limiting you. You too can ascend to the very lofty heights of deity. You too can be God. The devil said, define yourself. Don't let God define you. Define yourself. And so when man says, I'm going to define myself, whatever that self is, Whatever gender that is, whatever word that is that goes with their identity now, none of us should be surprised. That's the most natural thing to do. That's the most natural thing. In fact, we do it as church. Oh, make no mistake, we may not go to the same lengths that so many in our world do, but are there no husbands among us who in their ministry to their wives have said, I choose not to be a husband. That is not my identity. I will be unfaithful to my wife. Has that not happened? 
or as parents or as children or as employees or employers or as Christians have we never said in our walk with the Lord today, Lord, in this area of my life, in this aspect of my walk with You, my thoughts, my desires, my emotions, I am not going to be who You say I am. I'm not going to be who You want me to be. You have defined me one way. I define myself another. I define myself in terms of my sin, in terms of my rebellion, in terms of my selfishness, my pride, my whatever. Have none of us sinned? And said to God, no, no God, you don't get to define me. And yet that is exactly what God does, doesn't He? We heard it again in the water of baptism for Lydia. We heard it in our reading of the form for baptism. The very first thing it says to us in that form is, Lydia, all of us are sinners. That's who we are, whether we accept it or not. And we can only be saved if we're born again. If God by His Spirit does a mighty work. And then we read of all those rich promises of God to do just exactly that. To govern us. To redeem us. To sanctify us. And then really when you get to the third part of baptism, when you get to the part about the obligations, you might really just say the obligation of the baptized member of Christ's church is to be exactly who God says we are. Christian. Anointed. In Christ. That's what Lord's Day 12 is all about, which begins in its treatment of the anointing of which we speak with the anointing that Christ received. Jesus, of course, is called the Christ, the anointed. That's what Christ literally means. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. It's the same word except now in Hebrew. And Jesus is the one who came as the Christ for a very particular reason. Remember, if you ask yourself, who is Jesus? You can answer that question all sorts of ways. If you watch any kind of social media or any kind of discussion online about who Jesus is, you can be surprised at the description sometimes people give for for Jesus and for His ministry. For some reason or another, I have gotten into, uh, on my Facebook uh, feed, woke preachers talking about Jesus. And it's stunning to listen to these people describe who Jesus is. But who we say Jesus is isn't really relevant. Who God says Jesus is, well, that's very important. And God speaks to us in His Word. He speaks to us at the very beginning of Jesus' life in so many ways. We could detail the ways in which the announcement of Jesus' birth was made by the angels to Mary, to uh, Joseph, how Elizabeth, and that whole business was part of that story. But, but let's just focus for a moment at that moment that Jesus came to the Jordan River and there was baptized by John the Baptist. And you remember what happened then at the Jordan River, how the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. A dove didn't descend upon him. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. And the descent of the Holy Spirit was like the descent of a dove. And in that moment, God said from heaven, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. God declared to everybody at the Jordan at that time, declares to us when we read the Bible, He says, this one, this is my chosen Messiah. The one whom I have appointed to work salvation and to whom I give all of my grace in order to fulfill that work, my spirit to fulfill that work. Indeed, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus Christ served to announce to the world that He was in fact the Messiah and that He was provided for, He was given the grace, the power of God, the provision of God to fulfill this work on behalf of His people. That's always how it's been when people are anointed. Think about Aaron, the high priest, the great high priest when he was anointed. Think about David when he was anointed. Think about Elisha the prophet when he was anointed. A prophet, a priest, and a king all anointed in the Old Testament and identified by that anointing as the one commissioned by God for a particular task. Notice that Elisha wasn't anointed to do David's job. David wasn't anointed to do Aaron's job. They were anointed for a particular task. Not everyone may just do what they want to do, even if they're able. 
We ought to remember that in this day. We ought to remember that within the context of the church. So often in the church, the question of who can do what is answered only in terms of ability. Can they do it? Well, this lady over here can do wonderful things. She speaks very clearly. She's got a great insight into Scripture. She could be a preacher. Well, no, she couldn't. Because God appoints particular persons, and in the case of preachers, men, for that work. Just think in the context of our society, how judges, police officers, teachers, how they're appointed. Not just anyone can walk into a classroom and say, now you have to listen to me. Or pull somebody over on the highway and say, I'm going to give you a ticket. Oh no, you have to be appointed to that task. You have to be identified with a badge, with a robe, with some kind of indication by a board or by your principal in the school. This is your teacher. So that anointing someone in the Old Covenant, indeed anointing someone in the New, is God's way of telling people, listen to this guy, he's the one I've appointed for a particular task, whatever that task might be. But it's also the way of God's providing that person for what they need in order to do the job. God was giving them His Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, when they used oil, that's what oil represented. It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this person so that they could fulfill the task they'd been given. It was too much for them. They couldn't accomplish it on their own. They needed the Lord's help. Now, this isn't a general outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand that. We're not talking here about the Holy Spirit working regeneration in someone's heart and life the way that He does now that Pentecost has come. In the Old Covenant, certainly the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for a particular task was to equip that person for that task, an equipping that could come to an end. That's why David, in the, when he cries out to God for mercy, says, do not take your, your spirit from me. And that's why the King Saul, in fact, loses the Holy Spirit. Not in some profound way, not in some I've lost my salvation way, but in the sense that the Holy Spirit no longer equipped him for the task that he'd been given. So anointing in the Scripture is identifying someone as, as giving a particular task and the equipping of that person for that task. Let's take that now back into the ministry of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the Jordan River and see Jesus being anointed, being baptized by John the Baptist. Now comes the Holy Spirit. Now comes the voice of God. Now why would Jesus need to do that? It's a question John the Baptist actually asked in that moment as well. I don't need, you don't need to be baptized by me, said John. I need to be baptized by you. To which Jesus then said, let it be so for now to fulfill all righteousness. But it's a good question, isn't it? Why would Jesus need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit since He is the Son of God and so is one with the Holy Spirit? One in essence, though, different persons. We've seen that already in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 8. He and the Holy Spirit and the Father are one. So why would Jesus need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit? Surely He already had the Holy Spirit. Well, to answer that question, let's go all the way back to the beginning again. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And let's see again the creation of man and woman in the Garden of Eden. Let's remember that he was created in the image of God. And that's a, a, a word that describes not certainly the way that man looks, but the office that man held. That is, that man was created in a unique relationship with the Father and was given unique tasks by the Father as his Son to fulfill upon the earth. He was to have dominion. We know that over the face of the earth. That, of course, is a kingly function, isn't it? He was to guard the Garden of Eden. He was to tend it and protect it, says the Father. That's a priestly function. And remember, God spoke a word to Adam that he did not speak to the woman. The woman did not hear God say, you may not eat of that tree. Adam had to tell her, he had to speak the word. He had to be a prophet. So that from the beginning, man has had to be a prophet, priest, and king. But when we chose to rebel against God, then we chose not to fulfill those tasks. We were no longer able to, to be sure. We rebelled against God, didn't know His word, certainly couldn't guard the Garden of Eden against it anymore. There was an angel with a sword there. And we could not exercise dominion over the earth. Remember what God said to man in the curse. Nothing and no one will listen to you. 
But we still had the obligation to do these things. God had not given up on us. God had not said, well, I guess you don't want to do that. We'll have to come up with a plan B. The ability of man to fulfill the task he had been given was no longer his. But the office was. The responsibility was. And indeed, it is precisely because of that that we can understand our world as it is. Because our world still knows that it must worship God, still knows that it needs the revelation of God, still knows that it needs to exercise dominion. Our world knows, even environmentalists, even those people we might scratch our head at and wonder about, they are really reflecting that creative principle of God which says have dominion. They're trying to care for the earth. But we see how their care of the earth has gone so far one way because they've lost sight of who God is because they are not keeping it in the context of God's command for them. All religions are an expression of man's priestly reality, his being an image bearer of God and knowing that God exists. But man doesn't know who God is in truth. He worships the creature instead of the creator. And so we can look around us in society and we can see that humanity still bears the semblance of his being an image bearer, but is so twisted and perverted that he ruins everything he touches. Indeed, our world is full of chaos and condemnation as a result. Oh, there's still these moments of good things. There's still these shining moments in life where the creativeness of man, the creationalness of man is revealed, but it is so quickly obscured by man's rebellion and sin. Man lost the ability but retained the obligation. Man is still stumbling to find God, still trying to deal with the problem of guilt and shame, still trying to achieve happiness, and yet never achieving anything. That's a cause you understand of great struggle and stress for many people. That's an explanation for why our world is so broken and breaking. Man is always striving but never achieving, always wanting but never satisfied, always longing for security but always feeling afraid. That's the reality as we come to the baptismal or the baptism rather of Jesus Christ. And now comes this man, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, taking on human flesh so that he might be the last Adam that He might be the one who fulfills this office. Not just someone to do something over here or over there and magically make everything all right. No, He came to fulfill the task God had placed upon His creature. And so He became a creature and He accepted that task in His anointing at His baptism. He came to pay for our sins But to do so, He had to do what we would not and could not, what we refused to do. Jesus had to pay our our debt, and our debt involved obeying God, fulfilling the task of prophets, priests, and kings. Thus, Jesus in His work as the Christ came to do what we wouldn't, haven't, can't. Jesus came to be the perfect man. That's why He needed the Holy Spirit in His humanity at His baptism. He did not need the Holy Spirit as the eternal Son of God, but as the representative of humanity, as the covenant head of humanity. He needed to lead His people and needed to be equipped for that task by the Spirit's presence and power. So that Jesus' anointing is not just an interesting aspect of His ministry, it is the promise of the restoration of all of humanity. It is the promise, not only that your sins are forgiven, yes, that's true. It is the promise that not only is He the Messiah who saves you, that's also true. It is the announcement and provision by God that Jesus is the Messiah, the one sent for the purpose of redeeming for Himself a people, but the one in whom His people find their fullness, find their meaning and purpose, find their original task fulfilled. That is, in Jesus, humanity becomes fully human again. In Jesus, we are restored, made whole, and delivered from this brokenness that that exists all around us. 
in Christ, we are who we're supposed to be. But how is that so? Well, we too, you see, are anointed in Christ by His Holy Spirit. He received the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit dwells on Him in His fullness as the Messiah. Now, if you think only in terms of branches and vines, remember that Jesus Himself describes Himself as the good vine into which we are grafted as branches. And that life-giving power that dwells in the vine flows into those branches grafted into the vine. Those Christians who genuinely believe, who surrender their lives to the Lord, who look out at the world, who look into their own lives and see the purposelessness, see the brokenness, see the pain and sorrow, see the grief that sin brings and cry out to God for mercy and so rest in Jesus Christ as their Savior who say, in Jesus I have found the answer to all of my problems and embrace Him with a living faith. All of those who grab hold of Jesus, letting go of everything else in this life, receive in Christ the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into our lives, that we may now fulfill the task of prophet, priests, and kings. Now, to be sure, we're not anointed in this respect for the exact same reason Jesus was. That is, we do not deliver ourselves from sin or anyone else by our sacrifice. We do not exercise dominion in the way that Christ does at the Father's right hand. We do not reveal the Word of God as Jesus did and does. No, we are anointed to fulfill our original purpose as image bearers of God. Lydia here as a child, as a beautiful child. There's such hope. There's such beauty. There's such potential. And now if we go out into the world and we see people and we see their scars and we see their brokenness and their grief, their personality issues, their mental health issues, we see their broken relationships, we say, how can such a a promising life like this end up in such grief and sorrow? The answer, of course, is sin. How can we address it? What's the policy? What's the program? What's the thing we need? Ah, you see, we need more of Christ. We need more of Christ. We need people. If Lydia would be a full human being, then she must be united to Jesus Christ in order that His anointing would flow into her and she would confess His name to the world. To the world. Confess His name Not just in terms of faith. It is by the Spirit's regenerating power that we come to faith in Jesus Christ and lay hold of Him. But by His anointing grace to be prophets, we declare to the world, I am a Christian. That's what it means to confess His name. It doesn't just mean to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. It means to say to the world, Jesus Christ is King. And we are to show that in the way that we live, to present ourselves as living sacrifices of thanks. The Holy Spirit equips and enables us so that more and more we desire to do what's right. We love to serve the Lord. We see the joy in worship. We see the wisdom in His Word. We hate our sin more and more. We worship with gratitude in all that we do. So that not just our announcement to the world that we belong to Christ, but also our lifestyle declares that we are Christians. And then we fight. Oh, we fight. We fight against the devil and reign in eternity. We stand fast against all of the temptations and trials of this world. Life, people of God, in this world before Christ returns or before we go to glory, life is always a fight. A fight against sin, a fight against the old nature, a fight against the devil, a fight against the world and against our own flesh. And for that battle, we have been given the grace of God in Jesus Christ by the indwelling of His Holy Spirit that we are more than conquerors in Him. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to declare to the world, I belong to Jesus, to show it in our lives and to do battle with sin. Now, there are obvious ways in which this identity ought to find expression in all of our lifestyles, in all of our ways and words. 
There are ways in which the church expresses this truth in unique ways. We think of preachers who serve as the prophets of our congregation. We think of deacons who are our priests. They show us mercy. They give to us help and strength. We think of our elders who teach us to fight against sin, who are our kings. But maybe we shouldn't, or maybe we don't see rather how these broad categories impact us as students, as parents, as children, as workers. Maybe we don't see ourselves as prophets, priests, and kings on the job site or, on, uh, or in our car when we're driving to work or when we're at home doing our laundry. But what if, what if we began to see our identity in Christ in all of those ways? What if we say that mundane tasks, or what if we see that mundane tasks like laundry or cleaning the bathroom as an opportunity for us as anointed servants of the King, the King who did not come to be served but to serve, who washed the feet of His disciples, what if that's our moment for saying, I too am a priest in the Kingdom of God, anointed to serve? as an opportunity to thank God for our family, for His daily provision, for the health that we enjoy as we do these tasks? What if we realized that if tending that portion of God's creation given to us by cultivating it and keeping it, we're living as priests within a world to the service of our God? What if weeding the garden may not be the most profound work that we will ever do, but is in that moment an opportunity to say, Jesus, You are the Christ, and in You I have been given this place to tend, and I will as Your servant, anointed by You, work to do this task. And what if we resisted thinking of ourselves as merely individuals? So easy to think that I'm me and no one else needs to worry about me or judge me or bother me. But instead, what if we thought of ourselves as branches on a glorious tree, on a glorious vine, representatives of this body that God is redeeming in Jesus Christ? What if even when we're driving on the road in our cars, we say, I want to be a witness in this moment of my identity as a Christian as belonging to the company of the redeemed? So that the way that we drive, the way that we interact with our fellow drivers, testifies that we belong to Christ. What if working hard on a job site or being honest in our business dealings with each other, what if kind words spoken on the playground to our brothers or sisters in the backyard, what if the language we use or don't use is a way for us to confess Jesus Christ is King and I've been anointed to fight against sin and to do what is right. And what if all of this living of the Christian life is not a set of rules that you have to follow, a straitjacket to keep you from having fun? What if the Christian life is true humanity? is being fully man, fully alive. What if it's freedom? Not so much because of what we're not doing or aren't allowed to do, but because we know who we are, who we were created to be, whom we are redeemed to be. What if loving God, what if sacrificing for each other. What if having a community in this place so distinctive that the world begins to get jealous, begins to say, why are you so provided for? What if all of those people that march into hospitals to visit the sick, what if all of those people that come to help out that person in the congregation who's had trouble in their home and need to have it rebuilt or have trouble in some way and so they have a, a wheelchair ramp built for them? What if all of our support and ministry to each other in so many big ways and in so many small ways is not a sign that we're weak or that we're oppressed, but a sign that we're alive 
and living. And that we are united to Jesus Christ and so free from the chains of sin. What if living the Christian life is a privilege but not a pain? That's what this catechism, Lord's Day, challenges us to see. In Christ, humanity is restored to its glorious purpose and praise of God. In Christ, we've been given a glorious identity for we are Christians. In a world that's devolving, Look at the loss of stability in our world. Look at the loss of security. Look at the loss of purpose in so many people's lives. Look at the loss of meaning. Can we not as church stand out as those who have not only been given an identity, but an identity filled with grace and blessing and purpose? Our world is constantly trying to find fullness and fulfillment. They constantly want to experience blessing. They try to find it in their career, in a life that satisfies them in the things that they consume, that hoping it will all allow them to flourish. Yet for all of their chasing, the burden of anxiety, grief, and loneliness continues. We as church, we as Christians united to Christ, have a purpose that is glorious and good and is wrapped up in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ so that tomorrow, whether we like it or not, we are going to be a Christian, identifying to those around us what it means to be alive. And if you reject that, if you reject that identity, people of God, you're rejecting the very one who saves. But if you embrace it, and you embrace it as a believer united to Christ unto life. So be a Christian. Show the world that Jesus is the Christ by living in the power of His love. Let's ask the Lord for help in that in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we need Your grace and Your Spirit's presence and power to equip and enable us to do the work that You've given to us. We are so grateful, Lord, that we got to see today Lydia's baptism and might have seen in that as well your promise of the Spirit's presence and power in her life. You promise to give her your Spirit so that she might fulfill the task to which you've called her to be a Christian. Lord, may that encourage all of us who have received the water of baptism in our time. May it challenge us, O Heavenly God and Father, not to despise our identity, not to sell our birthright, not to reject our blessedness in Christ, but all the more to embrace it and to see that in Jesus Christ is fullness, is meaning, is identity and humanity and life. Help us to be in Christ who You've redeemed us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.